thank you. Uh, hello. Um, uh, thanks a lot for having me here. Uh, very colorful and diverse audience. Really great, uh, really excited. Also, big thanks uh, to uh, the talks that the team uh, that uh, talked before us and really prolonged in a great way uh, our talks and our work. Um, I will talk about the dynamics of the EIP 1559 fee market. And uh, this is uh, work that I have done jointly with Barnabé here and Sam. Uh, big thanks to them for introducing us to these problems and, uh, of course, to this uh, community. Uh, yeah, I'm Stefanos. And uh, also, the work that I present is a joint work with my collaborators from Singapore University of Technology and Design, Daniel Reisbergen, uh, Georgios, our inspiring uh, advisor there, uh, and Stratis. Uh, so, yeah, uh, all the things about the AIP 1559 are already known. We're very lucky to present at that point after uh, the, these great speakers. Uh, so let me go uh, uh, right away to the uh, dynamics that we're going to study here of the market. So um, at the center of EIP uh, 1559 is the base fee, as we heard before, uh, which is dynamically adjusted between blocks. Uh, so we have that the base fee of the next block is simply um, a scaled a version of the base fee of the current block. And uh, the exact value depends on the, um, uh, on the term that we see on the right here, so the block size, how much gas was used, and uh, essentially a normalized term here that says how, how much more uh, uh, gas was used in comparison to the target that we have, which is right now to have uh, half full blocks. Uh, and uh, this depends on a fixed le learning rate, which is currently the default now set at uh, uh, 1 over 8 or uh, 0 0.125. Uh, all right, so that's um, exactly the update rule. And what we want to do in this uh, talk and this work uh, is to stress test uh, this mechanism. Uh, and uh, what are the parameters that can change in the formula above? There are precisely two things that we can see here. So OK, the target, we want to leave it at half full blocks for many reasons. This is nothing that we want to play with. So we can change, of course, the block size, which depends on exogenous uh, uh, factors, like the demand that we have uh, for uh, use of the blockchain. Uh, and this is something that we want to study. We want to study how the mechanism reacts to different uh, demand conditions. Uh, we can also change the learning rate, which is set at uh, 1 over 8, and this is a parameter that we can decide, and we can uh, have different values for it, and we want to see uh, how different values of this parameter are going to change the mechanism. And uh, the last thing that we can do uh, uh, is to go to the design space of possible mechanisms, because this is just one mechanism to update the base fee. We can, of course, uh, start from scratch and think of different mechanisms. And here, uh, uh, if we want to go that way, uh, we have some constraints. For example, we want mechanisms that are simple uh, for many reasons uh, that I'm going to explain along the way. Of course, dynamic, because we have a very dynamic environment with blocks coming every few seconds. Uh, we want also the mechanism to be explainable and safe uh, to understand what it's doing so that users also understand what it's, it, it's doing. Um, so uh, if we want to, to uh, study different rules, as we are going to do along the way, uh, we want to keep these constraints uh, in mind. So, okay, our main task here was, uh, is to take uh, the EIP-1559 uh, transaction fee market and study it from a dynamical systems perspective, see how it behaves uh, 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 in time, and um, uh, whether some oscillations that we have seen empirically, whether they are uh, uh, bound to the mechanism that we have selected, or whether they are uh, due to some other reasons, as also uh, Tim uh, very nicely explained before. Uh, so let's go to start with some uh, stress tests. Maybe, okay, uh, a difficult figure to parse if you are not familiar with it. So let me try to explain uh, what we are looking at here. Let's start, for example, if you can see the hand here, let's start at the left of the x-axis where we see uh, 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 two kinds of block sizes, either empty blocks. So in the vertical axis, we see the block size and uh, we see either empty or full blocks. And this is something that we are familiar with 
we see that, for example, when we have quite a lot of demand, uh, we see a lot a large oscillations in the block. And what we change here in the horizontal axis is exactly the range of valuations that we have, uh, uh, that the people that try to interact with the blockchain uh, precisely have. So if you think that we have, uh, if we are close to zero, it means that we have quite a lot of people uh, that are coming and have the same valuation to transact with the blockchain. So essentially this means that a small change in the base fee with either uh, price all of them in or all of them out. So what we have here with this mechanism, the EIP-1559, is that as the base fee changes to uh, goes up, for example, to account for uh, very full blocks, it suddenly prices out everyone, uh, price everyone out. This means when we are close to zero, it means that we have uh, a, a lot of people that uh, are, uh, um, are, are at the same point, have the same valuation. Whereas if we go at the other extreme of the horizontal axis, around 25 here, if you can see it, where we see just one kind of blocks, uh, correct, exactly, uh, I'm sorry, one kind of blocks being produced, exactly half full, which is the target, here we have valuations that are nicely spaced, and the mechanism that we are studying, EIP-1559, can really predict the correct price, the correct posted price, and really price half of them out and half of them in. In between, we see a regime where we have this uh, uh, fancy shape where we have chaotic behavior. And this is one of the main findings of uh, our work, that the IP-1559 becomes chaotic. And we have uh, large oscillations for very uh, compressed demand, too many people coming uh, together, uh, chaotic behavior in between, and of course, nice behavior as expected, but to have this, we need to have um, a large uh, distribution of valuations, um, which of course is not always met in practice. Um, now we have a similar, uh, a similar figure for uh, the base fee dynamics. So what we saw before in the previous slide was the block sizes, the blocks that are produced. And here we see the base fee, how the base fee changes. So of course, again, if you go to the regime close to zero, you see that there exactly we have two values, one large one and one small one. The large one prices everyone out. That's why we had the, the uh, empty blocks. And the low one prices everybody in. So that's we ha why you had the full blocks. In between, we have, again, the chaotic regime. Uh, the re regime and then we have convergence to, to the correct value that EIP-1559 ideally could find and uh, produce all the time half full blocks. Of course, as you see, this is a chaotic behavior. So here, uh, a technical note, we have used a normal distribution uh, to, for the demand, but our results of uh, this behavior are robust to any kind of distribution. Uh, just a technical note, uh, no need to worry about if you are not familiar with uh, probability distributions. Uh, essentially, it says that uh, any kind of demand that we are likely to experience in reality uh, is likely to produce such results. So they are not specific to the technical assumptions uh, that we have followed here, are quite robust across uh, different um, assumptions. Uh, of course, uh, not everything is very bad here. Because as you see, uh, although we have chaotic behavior, everything happens within uh, some red lines that are uh, maybe a little bit uh, uh, impossible to see. Yeah, but everything happens within a, a certain region. And the nice thing with the IP-159 is that if we take the average, so horizontal, uh, uh, vertically, if we take the average of these very complicated uh, attractors or shapes that we are looking, uh, they are just right. And that's where we are looking at the bo figure in the bottom. We see, uh, if you see here, if, uh, th this is exactly 0 0.5. So we, we see that if we ignore, uh, modulo some noise, uh, uh, the blocks on average for every possible demand that we can experience are exactly uh, 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 equal to one half. Uh, this is a, a little bit bound to the simulation. I write here that it can also slightly overshoot uh, the target. And uh, this is indeed what we see in other um, uh, experiments, that we either we have exactly uh, half full blocks on average or slightly larger than that, so 53% or 52%, but not very larger. And above we see the base fee. The base fee is not entirely correct. The correct value would be on the red line, probably not visible, but uh, this doesn't matter because it produces uh, the correct block. So up to now we have seen quite uh, wild behavior from block to block uh, uh, dynamics, but we see a very nice behavior excluding some noise here. It's a fourth decimal number, so even maybe this goes also away, but it doesn't matter. We, we see very good behavior exactly as we want uh, if we take the average. Uh, now, this is a, in this case, we did a stress test, so we tested different conditions, even adversarial ones, a whole range of different conditions regarding the demand that we can experience. Now, I can go on and also produce similar shapes. I will not tire you more with uh, uh, such kind of shapes. 
uh, if, even if I change the learning grade. So this parameter D that is currently set at one over eight, again, you see if I have a very small learning grade, currently we are here at 0 0.1 to five, where we have some kind of chaotic behavior. If you remember also the previous paper, we saw uh, quite a lot of uh, full blocks uh, being produced by AIP 159 and a distribution of blocks um, uh, filling the whole space, and this is exactly what this stress test produced. So one takeaway is that we are using here a mathematical tool, and it has the ability to correctly predict uh, what's happening in reality. Again, uh, here what we uh, were stressing, what we are trying are different values for this uh, learning rate. Of course, smaller learning rates have very good behavior, lead to convergence, but this means that they are very slow. And uh, larger ones create, uh, uh, tend to ca create chaotic behavior. I will not tire you more, so we can get, again, for the base fee, quite wild behavior. But on average, we have very nice uh, performance. Uh, these are very similar to the previous ones, uh, so I'm going fast uh, through the slides. Here we see the block sizes for, uh, for example, the current learning rate. They are slightly above um, uh, 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 0 0.5, which is the ideal. They are uh, at 0 0.53. I think there are quite a few reasons uh, why this happens. Here we provide also a mathematical reason for having uh, uh, blocks um, uh, that are uh, more than half full, but not by much. Okay, so uh, so we stress this two parameters that I, I promised in the first slide, so the learning rate and the demand, and uh, uh, the only thing that we uh, that remains uh, to do now, it's the third one, to go to the design space. So what we have here, let's recap, so we have that the IP59 is simple, and it's quite a very important point, uh, because we don't want to have a very complicated mechanism that we don't understand, because then we will need to stress test along a much larger space of conditions and really get lost and not know what we expect. When we have a simple system, we know what, where it can fail, and we know, even if it's not perfect, we know what to expect. Uh, now, when we go to the design space to study different uh, mechanisms, maybe the mindset here is like, uh, uh, the meme that we have, so we want to be perfect. And the question is uh, whether we can do better. So we have a simple uh, mechanism that is working. It nails it perfectly on average. Okay, sometimes it may be slow, as we're gonna see also later, but now we really adopt this uh, perfectionist uh, mindset and say, okay, can we do better? You are on my list now, we want to do better. We want to, to see if we can improve even in this case. So let's see. Let's uh, have some empirical data to see whether the uh, uh, where to start from. Uh, what we see here in this figure um, uh, is precisely also described by the previous uh, speakers. Uh, what happens when we have an NFT drop? So here we see with a bl blue line the gas price that is paid paid by the users, and with the red line we see uh, the base fee dynamics. And we see here what is, was presented also by the previous speakers, that we have a gap between the actual uh, average price pays by, paid by the users and the current base fee. So what happens here is that for some blocks, the miners are really lucky because they, uh, uh, the base fee hasn't cut up and people are pay, paying quite high prices and all this uh, is getting to uh, uh, received by the miner. But here, when the base fee cuts up in the end, uh, the miners that are producing these blocks are now having a much lower uh, reward. So, okay, we heard that it's not a problem to have these oscillations and to have good performance on average, but actually we see here that we have an interblock variability and miners may, this may, may create some problems for miners for having very unequal rewards. So in this case, something that would change this uh, figure would be if we had a faster learning rate, a higher learning rate, so that the mechanism could adjust much, much faster. Uh, but this is during the NFT drop. If we don't have an NFT drop and we have normal conditions, uh, like here, so we have the same demand um, uh, through the whole window that we are plotting here, we see that, for example, people okay, are paying uh, sometimes different uh, prices. Uh, the base fee, the red line here, is fairly stable. It's uh, oscillating in this chaotic regime, but uh, within some bounds. This is not a problem. What is the problem is that uh, the block sizes are quite erratic. So we have full blocks, empty blocks, and this is absolutely not necessary given that the demand is quite stable at that point. Again, this creates a uh, uh, large variability in the rewards received by miners, even of consecutive blocks. Uh, in that case, to avoid this, we would like to decrease the learning rate. So have a, a, a much lower a D, this parameter D that we were, was set at one over eight. We want to have a smaller one that will uh, lead to much smaller changes um, in the demand. So what to do? Uh, 
the, the question is whether we can combine now the uh, best of both worlds and have both things, have also a large learning grade, a small learning grade, and of, of course study a different mechanism that, um, than currently EIP-1559 uh, is implementing. So how to have a variable learning grade? We want to have a high learning grade during demand peaks where we have aggressive adjustments and a low learning grade uh, during uh, uh, stable demand. So if you remember the formula in the first slide, uh, we just had this D, this is exactly the learning grade of the mechanism, and this is constant all the time, and we want now Going, uh, going to the design space and trying to modify this mechanism, of course, uh, we don't want to go very far because, as I said in the beginning, if we go into, uh, down that way, we are going to introduce more complex mechanisms and this is going to create uh, uh, new threads and we, want, we will need then a more complex uh, uh, stress test uh, uh, analysis to reveal all the faults of the mechanism and that will be data. So here we're going to do a very minimal uh, change inspired by internet congestion control with, where we have additive increases and multiplicative decreases to control congestion. Um, so very briefly, without going uh, into technicalities, what we will do, we are going to track not, not just the, the base fee, uh, not just the, the, uh, um, the block size of the last block, but let's say of the last five blocks or something like that. And if we have exactly the correct value, so if we are uh, close to 0 0.5, meaning we have stable conditions, we want to dampen the changes uh, uh, in our base fee. So we are going to decrease the learning rate, not the base fee, the learning rate. And this will create uh, very, very similar base fees uh, between consecutive blocks. Uh, on the other hand, if we have uh, the average, so meaning we have, let's say we have four or five full consecutive full blocks, what, 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 which is exactly what we observe when we have an NFT drop, uh, then we want an aggressive change. We want to implement an aggressive change in the base fee. And to do that, we're going to increase exactly the railing rate. Of course, as I said also many times before, adding complexities is not a panacea because it's going to introduce new threats and we will need uh, a more complex um, uh, stress test to be sure that it's going to work on practice. Uh, all right, so let's see some simulations that we did now with uh, both mechanisms, so EIP-1559 and uh, the Additive Increase Multiplicative Decrease, uh, AIMD. Uh, so here we have uh, what we saw before, AIP-1559, uh, oscillating uh, during a normal period with stable demand, and here a AIMD uh, looks much more stable. And uh, similarly, in the demand peak, uh, EIP-1559 leaves this gap here, which creates unequal rewards for the miners, to the very least, uh, whereas AIMD catches up very quickly. Of course, the question is, AIMD now has different parameters to implement these changes, and uh, this means a larger space. So there is a danger that when we have this figure here that, that shows that AIMD works well, uh, that we are overfitting the data that we have uh, seen. So if uh, EIP-1559 is simple, so it works the same overall conditions, and uh, if it fails at some point, then this will be the same everywhere. Here we have the danger that we are performing well against some condition that we saw, so a NFT drop and stable demand, but maybe overfitting to these conditions means that we are going to do very bad in some kind of conditions that we haven't seen. So. AIMD is not, uh, gives a promising direction, but uh, uh, one should be cautious and uh, 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 not say that it solves uh, all the problems. Some more data here about the full data set performance of uh, this mechanism. We have two performance metrics. So we see here in the figures the blocks produced, uh, block sizes produced by AIMD during stable demand. We see less uh, oscillations, less full blocks, and uh, much less empty blocks and also here during the demand peak. An interesting metric here in the performance is that the current, we implemented the current EIP-1559, we implemented EIP-1559 with a small step size and with a, a large learning rate or step size. In all these cases, we had uh, quite a large amount of uh, very full blocks, so blocks uh, more than 95% full. Uh, but with the AIMD, we had a very low numbers of, of this kind of blocks, and also on average, all of them uh, did well. Uh, maybe the AIMD again did better, but I, as I said, uh, introducing more parameters uh, uh, creates the danger of uh, overfitting the data that we have and um, creates more possibilities for things uh, going wrong. Okay, so let me recap. 
uh, uh, what our research has shown for EIP-59 is that now currently it is at a phenomenal advantage. So as very eloquently uh, Tim said before, these kind of mechanisms cannot be solved, uh, problems cannot be solved by uh, off-the-shelf solutions from economics, and doing something now right or better than everyone else, like EIP-59 is doing, uh, puts this mechanism and, uh, of course, the Ethereum uh, ecosystem at a phenomenal advantage. Of course, it's not perfect, but uh, it's as good as it gets for now, and it's a very good starting point to improve in the future. Uh, as a, a, a very short takeaway, uh, block sizes are achieved on average. Of course, this creates, uh, uh, this leaves, we have the interblock variability. Uh, it was argued before that it's not a big problem, also by Vitalik and the previous speakers. And maybe just as a point here, as a side note, uh, these oscillations create um, uh, differences in mining rewards, which may be uh, a source of concern for miners. Uh, also, it's worth uh, studying maybe alternative mechanisms uh, under the constraints that I mentioned, keeping it simple and able to be studied, so with variable running rate. Also, uh, uh, variations of EIP-59 or the automated mar market maker mechanism, quite um, uh, interesting right now. Um, we, we are also producing results in these directions, uh, will be soon available. And maybe some uh, reference to the resources uh, of uh, this talk. So we have two papers on archive. Uh, 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 you are welcome, of course, to uh, have a look and also uh, reach out if you have uh, any questions. Uh, the last one was uh, the transaction fees on honeymoon was very recently updated also with uh, newest results. And you can also find on GitHub um, uh, libraries uh, for uh, the simulations that we have in this paper and uh, um, the agent-based simulations here or the simulations in the, that I presented before uh, by Daniel here, our collaborator, uh, um, excellent uh, repository here and excellent work. Yeah, so um, that's all for me. Uh, thanks a lot and of course uh, contact us if you have any questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Stefanos. Uh, that was a great talk. Thank you. Um, is there any questions from the audience? Uh, hi. Thank hi. you very much for the presentation. Very Thank interesting. You. Uh, you mentioned there briefly at the end the interblock variability. Yes. And I'm curious if you have more thoughts around, like, at, let's say, this block time affecting the, the desirability of different update rules. For example, of smaller granularities, maybe. Yes. Let's say one intuition I have is that maybe the chaotic part of it is less of a problem as you yes. have shorter block times because the user experience will still be pretty all right. Yes. And I'm curious around your thoughts around that. Correct. Uh, so, uh, yeah, exactly. The chaotic behavior is not really a problem. So you really have it. And it's chaotic behavior within some bounds, uh, uh, as you said. Uh, the user experience uh, is much more worried about the average performance, and since you have blocks coming very soon uh, close to each other, um, the result uh, is pretty good. I think the main point for uh, the main concern for the variability, interblock variability, is the reward for miners and. Uh, the topic for which there is quite a lot of uh, discussion, the MEV, um, uh, that it's going to be very different between miners of consecutive blocks. So, for example, you mine a block, it's full, and the very next block is empty, and uh, you can of complain of getting nothing uh, out of mining that block, so getting a very low amount of fees. The users do not experience that because it's just 10 seconds or something like that, uh, but the miner uh, has a large var uh, variance in their payoffs. So I think that's, that's the main concern. Otherwise, the chaotic behavior um, uh, is indeed not really a concern. And, so, and I think it's also inherent to most, uh, most mechanisms that are using uh, this kind of updates. So also the AIMD are also using different um, uh, learning rate. Uh, again, creates chaotic regime. But it's not, uh, as you say correctly, it's not uh, that bad for the user. Only for the miner, I, I would say there is the problem. So if um, that's that, that's the only source of concern. I don't know if this answers the question. If okay, thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Thank you. This is based on uh, proof of work. If we move to proof of stake, what's going to happen? Yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, uh, there, we're going to have, um, of course, fixed intervals in the uh, in the blocks, and also know the miner. I think that from a pure dynamical perspective, as a dynamical system, 
I don't expect much to change in the behavior of the dynamics. Uh, because you have, again, the transactions arriving in the pool, some of the, them get uh, into the, uh, one block, some of them remain. But the big changes will be there, I think, for the miners, and knowing which block they are going to mine. For example, an NFT drop is approaching, and you know you're not going to mine first, you're going to mine late in the drop, or something like that, and you're going to get the blocks with the low payoffs. And maybe then it creates uh, very perverse incentives of and very uh, complicated threat models that we need to study. So that's actually a very, very good question. And uh, yeah, that, that would be a great direction to, to study before, of course, launching the proof of stake uh, system. I think, yeah, that's uh, totally at the point. Yeah, this is something that Tim you touched me. upon in his talk as well. Yeah. yeah, the move to proof of stake will be really interesting. I think. Yes. Yep. A good question. Do you have any lessons or recommendations about the implementation of such simulations? Uh, like the, actual, the actual simulation software? Um, yeah, well, as about the software to use to, to do the simulations. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, just Python or uh, things like that, we have used also for the agent-based simulation and for the other one, or uh, I think Daniel did the, the simulation also, the last part is also in Java or JavaScript, not sure which of the two. Uh, but yeah, we haven't used some, something much more fancy that, than that to produce them. Also MATLAB works if you are old school. <laughs> Yeah, I can maybe even talk about it. The ABM simulations yes. that was part of that work. I think uh, they work really well to study, let's say, more theoretical patterns. But now we're trying to augment them with actual on-chain data as well as transaction pool data to try and see how different mechanisms would work. And for instance, see what happens when you move to proof of stakes and you have uh, fixed block times. So. It, simulations are nice, but when you augment them with the data, it's, they become even better and they're really useful as a predictive tool. Uh, also, maybe to add something here, uh, also mentioned by the previous speakers, that the, the mempool is a quite interesting direction to, to go next. It, it's going to give quite a lot of information because all the simulations assume quite a lot of demand. And um, OK, mathematically, you do some assumptions that it's uh, going away and coming again in the next block, which is not entirely realistic. Uh, it gives you the correct uh, outcome, but maybe it's much more interesting to see uh, and learn lessons from the mempool. Uh, that would be very interesting. Yep. Thank you again, Stefanos. Thank you. Thanks a lot for having me. Thank you. Thank you.